faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resilient. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Hey guys, Jared Moon here and welcome to the Better Humanology podcast. Super excited about today's episode. Today we have Dr. Allison Brager. She's going to fix your sleep, she's going to fix your brain, and it's going to be awesome. That's about all I have to say because I want you to get straight into this episode and start taking notes. So here we go with Dr. Allison Brager. All right, Allison, I'm super pumped to have you on the the Better Humanology podcast. So first I just want to say welcome and thank you so much uh, for joining me on the show today. Uh, it's awesome to be on the show. Thank you so much. Uh, so we like to start every show with uh, getting the listeners primed for their week, pumped up, ready to go uh, with some challenges. So I was wondering if you could help me out by first starting with a fitness challenge that we could give uh, the listeners this week. Uh, I would, the past week, we've actually been doing quite a few strongman workouts in our gym. Uh, I convinced our owner to invest in some heavy med balls and uh, farmer carries and uh, a sled to drag. So uh, I would say put down the barbell, uh, put down doing some squats and uh, pick up a heavy med ball and just walk around with it. You would be amazed at how much it tax, taxes your uh, respiratory system and just totally works your posterior chain. Awesome. Awesome. All right. And, uh, would you say like bear hug it or like put it on your shoulder? Oh, bear hug. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the best way. I mean, you can walk around it with, a, you know, with it on your shoulder, but yes, the bear hug is where it's at. All right. Great. All right. How about a mental toughness challenge? Um, so I don't know about y'all, but I'm kind of sort of ADD and that has, I think worked to my advantage in my career, but I have a really hard time sitting still. And a few months ago, somebody gave me this challenge to just sit on the couch for five minutes and do absolutely nothing. Like no phone, no music, just sit in silence. And it's not even meditation. Like you don't, you can't close your eyes. You can't do anything. It was the hardest five minutes of my life. (laughs) to Just sit there on the couch with nothing, no type of input and no blocking of input by, you know, closing my eyes or uh, you know, t- concentrating on breathing. So I would, that's what I give you as a challenge, I would say. <laughs> you know, and that's something I've I don't noticed. How effective it would be for other people, but it was damn sure effective for me. No, that'd be a good challenge for me. I noticed that if I, if I don't have access to my phone or something to do and I just, I end up sitting down somewhere, I am like, yeah, it only takes about 16 seconds. And I'm like, okay, what, it, I gotta, I'm do this, do that. You reach for a phone, it's not there or something. Uh, yeah, we are. We're all over the place these days, so constantly right. stimulated. All right. How about a book recommendation? Oh, uh, I just finished Tools of Titan by uh, Tim Ferriss. Amazing. Awesome. It was, it was so enlightening because, you know, I've read 4-Hour Body, 4-Hour Work Week, and all of that. But to hear the sentiments of other hugely successful people across the globe, it, I've, I, I essentially have, like, 10 page journal from taking notes after reading tools of Titans. Yeah. He has uh, some incredible people in that book. Was there any like a uh, personal favorite you have? Yeah. And I think this is something that you and I, we communicated about through email is, uh, changing your mindset. So Tim says, uh, I can't remember who he interviewed, but whoever he interviewed said, I hate the word busy because busy implies that I can't manage stress and I have no control over my life. So instead of saying I'm busy, say something like I'm productive. I don't know why. That was like my biggest takeaway from the book was it, it like uh, using euphemisms or like change how like a different word can totally change your outlook or mindset uh, towards something. Awesome. All right, Allison, I really, really appreciate that. And I know all the listeners do as well. Um, so now let me... Uh... Well, actually, I would give you a minute just to kind of explain your background, who you are, uh, you know, what you've been doing the last several years. You're a very uh, fascinating person. I'm very, I'm looking forward to, <laughs> to asking you a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll let you give the background to all the listeners. That's a, that's a great way to put it. I'm sure a lot of people are like, what do you actually do on a daily basis? <laughs> um, 
So I grew up as a lifelong athlete, uh, ran, did track and field in college, uh, was a multi-event athlete specializing in pole vault and hurdles. Uh, I was also always interested in science. So around my junior year, I started working in a biology lab, absolutely fell in love with it. So after that, I decided to go on and get my PhD. And early on in my career, a lot of people told me to plan my career around my lifestyle and not my lifestyle around my career. That has totally worked to my benefit. Um, in graduate school, I looked at the genetics of uh, timing of activity and sleep and uh, a focus on exercise. So how exercise could serve as a rewarding substitute for drugs of abuse. Um, after that, you kind of can't right jump into like a career as a college professor or like traditional research in a university life. So you kind of have to do fellowships after that. So I was fortunate enough to move to Atlanta, Georgia after that, um, where I did uh, work on the genetics of sleep. And it was there in Atlanta where I met the great group of teammates that I trained with for four years uh, with Squat Mafia at CrossFit Terminus. Uh, so Emily Bridger, Steve Hoover, Sonia McMillan, uh, the four of us were together uh, training for about four years. Uh, we were fortunate enough to make it to the games twice as a team. Um, obviously, Emily Bridger's, her success speaks um, in and of itself. And... Um, it was a great time in Atlanta. Uh, so after that, I um, was also teaching in Atlanta at a, a small, um, historically black all-male school. And uh, early on, I realized I just, I kind of hated climbing the ivory tower. Um, I love doing research, but there was so much arrogance and selfishness and just like, it wasn't true education. Everyone was always just worried about their ego and putting forth their name out in the field. So uh, randomly enough, I got a contact through the military uh, about joining uh, the group at Walter Reed and doing sleep and performance science uh, for soldiers. And so uh, I quit my job um, as a college professor and as a researcher. And in, since July, I've been living here in DC, uh, working for Walter Reed as a military scientist. Uh, I originally came on as a civilian, but very recently I commissioned as a captain in the army. And so I'm headed to Texas very shortly here for my uh, basic officer's training. Um, I love my job. I definitely think I have a dream job and it blends my uh, career interests with my lifestyle. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the uh, next 20 years of doing work for the military. That's awesome. And, you know, the, the military does a lot of fascinating stuff now with, uh, like you're, you're saying, different research. Uh, they have strength and conditioning coaches they're bringing on in special operations career fields and all sorts of stuff. It's the, uh, the, the yeah, sports and performance industry as a whole is getting sucked into the military. And I think it's really awesome and provides a lot of great opportunity, like what you're doing. Um, it sounds like anytime you can do what you're passionate about um, and do it in a, in a setting uh, like the military, I think that's, that's incredible. Oh, yeah. Um, actually, I had to take the new, uh, newly formatted OPAT test two weeks ago. It's actually based off of CrossFit. They spent years developing it at uh, Natick, Massachusetts. And uh, the beep test, the traditional shuttle sprint beep test, it's really tough. Like, you could really, really push yourself. It's, you know, kind of like in CrossFit, how they do those death by thrusters or death by 20 meters workouts. Right. It was it was good. So what's the um, what's the new test? I'm just asking out of curiosity because when I left, they hadn't uh, implemented any of that stuff yet. I don't think so. I'm just curious as uh, how that um, came along. So there's four movements. Uh, honestly, I feel like the deadlift could be higher. So that's the first event. Is it's a uh, trap bar deadlift. Uh, it goes up to two twenty five for guys and one fifty five for girls. So it's it's a piece of cake for any CrossFitter. Yeah. Um, when I saw it being developed in San Diego, I mean the, the kids that were doing it looked like not even in decent shape, and they made it to two twenty five fine. So I think they'll tweak that over the years because that movement in and of itself is supposed to be an an indicator of your MOS assignment in terms of like the type of load you could handle. 
Um, so we'll see what happens with that. The second event is a standing bra jump. Um, I will brag that at the uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland Recruiting Center, I have the top mark. Nice. Right? <laughs> because they don't, they're actually not scaling it for men for women. So it's all the same. And a part of that is because of women now being allowed to be in special ops. Um, so that's the second event is three tries for a standing broad jump. The third event is uh, a med ball toss where you're seated against the wall. And that's actually really difficult because if you have bad uh, posterior chain stability or even just poor flexibility, it would really come through when you uh, throw, throw the med ball. And then the last uh, event, which is, of course, the hardest, uh, is the beep test. So... You have uh, a certain amount of time to sprint from one cone to another that's placed 20 meters apart. And then, of course, as the test continues, the beeps, there's a shorter duration in between. So you're really sucking win by the time you reach the fourth round. Um, I got up to six rounds. But, you know, once you hit, once you fail once, it's kind of, you know, the point of diminishing returns. You're always going to fail after that. Uh, but I really enjoyed it because, uh, you know, years ago, I actually um, one, was thinking about doing officer school with the Marines. And, you know, it was like the classic three mile run uh, push ups, pull ups test. And I, I honestly think the OPAT will be more effective and, and an easier way to screen people in for the military, but also um, in terms of MOS assignments. I think that's great. I think it's awesome that, yeah, I've always hated the. Uh... Let's do some push-ups and go for a run, and we'll determine, you know, your fitness level. I've always thought it was kind of silly, so I, I like that that a lot better. Yeah. All right. So I now let's hop into some of this other stuff. Um, you know, you, you just you have so many, uh, so much, such a great diverse background. Um, you know, and I, I I almost don't even know what direction to take it, but I do know where I want to start, <laughs> and that's with your your book. Um, the book is titled "Meathead: uh, Unraveling the Athletic Brain." Um, and from my understanding, I haven't read it yet, but I actually am going to read it um, after our podcast probably started this week is um, what I heard what I was reading about it was that it's kind of exercise in athletic performance at the level of the brain. Um, and yeah. so I was wondering if you could maybe explain some of the ideas or concepts in that book. Uh, maybe we could talk about some of them. Sure. Um, a little bit about the history of the book. So um, there was a point in time during my fellowship when our lab completely ran out of money. And in science, when your lab runs out of money, like the operations entirely shut down. So it was one of those things where I could come to work every day for eight months and do nothing, or I could actually do something uh, to further my career. And I had this brilliant idea to write this book on this particular topic because there actually was nothing on the market at that time. Um, serendipitously enough at that time we had also qualified for the CrossFit Games the first time uh, so that was me Emily Bridgers and uh, the rest of Squat Mafia CrossFit Terminus so it's like the perfect timing to write this book uh, so the main thesis of the book is actually debunking the myth of the dumb jock uh, so I, I went to college at an Ivy League school and back then they did lower the standards a little for the athletes because they compete at the D1 level. And so not every D1 athlete is going to also be a great scholar. Uh, so I always felt like there was this stigma against me in college that people, actually people would tell me to my face that I was stupid and I only got into Brown because I was good at track and field. So, you know, fast forward 10 years, if I look at all my friends who were college athletes and all my friends who just went to college, my, all my friends that were college athletes are way more successful, not just professionally, but personally. Uh, so that's where the thesis of the, the history of the book came from. Uh, so after that, I basically just, you know, read through biomedical databases and articles uh, related to neuroscience and exercise physiology. And then, of course, I wanted to, it to have like a hometown girl feel so I uh, blended in my own athletic experiences. Um, so the first chap the first half of the book focuses on uh, this thesis as to why athletes are actually extremely intelligent and not dumb jocks. Um, it focuses it focuses on like 
structural changes as well as dynamic changes and rewiring the brain uh, with training and competition. And then the last half of the book is actually more related to what I do now, which is using aspects of neuroscience. So finding ways to manipulate sleep or finding ways to enhance mental performance um, in order to enhance physical performance. Uh, so it's half science, set, half self-help, more or less. That's awesome. And you said you, you're, you're on the sleep side uh, now. And so, I mean, what do you see as, um, you know, I, I don't want to go too broad with it, but I guess uh, sleep and athletic performance, um, how do they, they play together? So one of the things I keep emphasizing uh, to a lot of people is sleep timing and the the power and the necessity to establish a routine. Um, so, we, you know, we have these self-sustaining clocks in our body that tell us when to eat, when to train, when we optimally perform at our best. Um, some of it is regulated by a schedule we've maintained over the years, but most of it is, related, is regulated by genetics. So I always tell athletes to figure out what your natural biological schedule is. Uh, myself, for example, I'm a vampire. Like I am such a night person and so are everyone else in my family. Um, so I know I train best later in the evening or later in the morning. I can't do a workout before 8 a.m. Um, and, and so this is something I'm trying to emphasize um, with other athletes is to figure out your schedule and if you can, work your training around your natural schedule, because that will only benefit you, uh, in the long term. You know, that's, uh, this is just kind of happened out of, um, necessity. I, I noticed that, uh, I used to wake up every morning, um, at like 4 45 and then I'd be, you know, training by like 5 AM. Um, and I would get the training done. Uh, but I, I never was at a point where like I, when I started, I, I mean, I probably trained that way for almost a year and I don't think I ever once hit a PR or like, you know, I never could really bring that intensity in the morning. So I shifted my workout schedule to like, just like 11 a.m., 12 p.m., like uh, around when lunchtime would be for most people. Um, right. And my intensity level skyrocketed. I, w I was able to train a lot better and, and <laughs> uh, do a lot better. And that just was kind of a natural current. So you think that my, I just was, uh, I wasn't operating how I should from a genetic standpoint on like what my body wants to do. Right. Okay. Yep. Cool. All right. So, um, I, I do want to talk about kind of the, the fitness of the brain with that, that had me very fascinated when I was reading some stuff uh, about, you know, you look like you had some introduction to plant-based medicines and, uh, ways to keep the brain, uh, you know, fit and, and healthy. Um, is, is, do you think that, uh, the brain should be exercised in and of itself or exercise, physical exercise is the exercise for the brain? Wow. I, this is probably the most fascinating question I have ever been asked on any podcast. Um, I think it's the former. And the reason I say that is because, um, you know, exercise is just like any other basic instinct. It's treated as a reward. And the brain gravitates towards rewards. Uh, the chemical of reward is dopamine. I actually have dopamine tattooed on my left arm. Uh, That's awesome. Because if uh, if I if there's any neurochemical that describe me most, it would be the neurochemical of pain and pleasure, which is dopamine. Uh, so the brain, when it pumps out dopamine, and it's when it releases dopamine, it's typically in response to either a pleasurable stimulus or a painful stimulus. The brain can't discriminate between both. Uh, so that's why, like exercise, for example, is a great natural therapy for people who are at risk for drug addiction or any sort of uh, addiction. Um, and, you know, that's, this has been studied in the lab. Uh, this is something I studied during my PhD and other colleagues of mine have studied, is that you can get animals to get, you can get animals to be just as addicted to exercise as they are to drugs of abuse. Um, so, yes, I think it's, I think, the, the need for exercise is internally regulated. Um, and obviously to me, I think that's the explanation why CrossFit is so popular. There's something about that pleasurable pain of CrossFit that just, you know, when we say you 
people are drinking the CrossFit Kool-Aid, that is why is because the the dopamine, I guarantee, and nobody studied this, I guarantee the dopamine response to CrossFit is just so unique and so like fine-tuned and calibrated at the level of the brain that it just it can't help but want to, you know, have more CrossFit. And is it something that you can become accustomed to? Because like caffeine, obviously, if, if you're consuming large amounts of caffeine, you, you you develop some sort of tolerance, right? You either need more oh, yes. or whatever. And is that the same when it comes to exercise and, and dopamine release? Absolutely. Yeah, there is a, there's a huge body of literature looking at uh, dopamine tolerance. I mean, most of it isn't with exercise at all. It's all with drug addiction. But there's like three phases of tolerance. There's a a a phase of rapid tolerance, which is like usually within the first 72 hours. And then there's chronic tolerance, which is, you know, um, after weeks and weeks of this repeated pleasurable or painful stimulus. So how about you specifically in exercise? Because you are, you know, a really high level athlete. Do you feel like you have to really go there to get that that dopamine (laughs) release? Yeah. I am addicted to exercise and I know now that I'm not training for the games anymore and I'm just, you know, trying to maintain the level of fitness that I want to, I know that I have a tolerance because on a daily basis, um, you know, I follow the gym's programming, but I always need to do more. I always like to do the, like a hero workout or like an endurance based workout. Like I can't, a lot of times, you know, when you're training for the games, you're doing those short, high intensity bursts and uh, what do you call like the um, OPT style workouts. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I hate those. I, <laughs> I mean, even though I'm trained as that type of athlete, there's something about doing the, the hero workouts and the enduring nature of it that uh, I gravitate towards that. And I honestly think it's because of my crave, my need to, to get my, you know, dopamine pump. <laughs> That's awesome. Um so let, let's uh, shift back to um, maybe performance for the brain. Um, what do you think that, you know, if you wanted to, uh, I don't know, get your brain in shape, if you will, I, I mean, is there supplements or daily practice? How, how do you, uh, you know, keep your brain fit? Well, I had the pleasure of spending a week with uh, the guys at Barbell Shrugged, Mike Bledsoe. I learned so much about fitness and mindfulness from them that we're like sort of implement met, implementing a lot of stuff that they do into our own studies now. Um, I used to be a half believer of meditation um, until I really started reading into Wim Hof's mm. uh, stuff. And then honestly spending a week with Mike, we went to the uh, world's largest meditation gardens. And then I also did the float tank Um I really think that is a great way to enhance uh, mental functioning. And I've looked a little bit into the research of it. Um, There's like Buddhist monks can selectively and actively induce a state of sleep uh, because they're so in tune and so present with what state of consciousness they're in and what the state of their environment is that they, they can force themselves asleep while being awake. Um, there's people who have actually gone up to Nepal and have studied Buddhist monks and have looked at their brain activity. And their brain activity it almost mirrors that of any person's uh, when you're in like a, a state of deep sleep. Um, so that's what I would, I think that's the, like the new frontier for uh, Yeah, it's gaining a lot of performance a lot of popularity and i've been doing the uh, wim hof method for a while now is it something that you practice regularly i do it every morning awesome yeah. so um brian mckenzie came to our gym at crossfit terminus let's see march of 15 he's actually coming again uh this upcoming march and uh the first time i did it i like i felt so euphoric um, but yeah, ever since he came, I do it every single morning. I'm not sure how much it's helped me uh, physically, but like in terms of my mental um, outset for the day, it, it just on days that I don't do it, I I suffer. And do you um, consider? Because being someone who actually does the Wim Hof method, I 
Uh, sometimes I differentiate, uh, you know, meditation and the Wim Hof method, but I feel like they can almost be done simultaneously. Do you kind of? They are. Yeah. 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 <laughs> is that so? You uh, is that your meditation as well as like during the Wim Hof method? Exactly. Yes, that's my meditation. So I feel like that's my whole morning in general. Um, you know, I am a productive person, but I also. I don't jump right into things in the morning. Um, I've always made it a habit to live very close to work um, since I was 18, you know, like walking to class and all of that. Um, my morning consists of waking up, doing Wim Hof, uh, getting ready, and then drinking coffee and listening to music as I walk to work. Uh, so I feel like the first hour of my morning is like complete mindfulness and meditation and being with myself and being alone uh, before I jump into my day. Yeah, I really enjoy it. And it does take a little bit of time, but I mean, it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's well so worth it. It's so worth it for your mental health. I, yeah. I, I completely agree. Uh, so let's go uh, over some uh, plant-based medicines or maybe... Uh, is it neurotropics versus nootropics? Like they're, are they, they're different, right? Um, I've always heard nootropics. I haven't okay. heard of, well, neurotrophic, you're thinking of neurotrophic. Yeah. So neurotrophic is a, a natural, naturally released growth factor by your brain. Uh, the most commonly studied one is brain derived growth factor. And they're essentially involved with, uh, repairing damaged neurons nerve cells, and then also supplying nerve cells with daily nutrients or resources that they need to keep functioning. Those are neurotrophics. Okay. Um, and those have been widely studied, of course, with Alzheimer's and exercise because exercise, of course, is recommended for people at risk for Alzheimer's like me. And the reason is because exercise in naturally increases the release of these neurotrophics uh, by the brain. Okay. And so, how, how about nootropics? So nootropics are um, materials found in the environment. So obviously they're plant-based uh, organics that have been shown to have the same effect as on exercise in that they increase neurotrophics and the release of other brain-boosting or like brain recovery, brain repairing pathways of the brain. Um, one of the ones that I haven't worked or have studied much with uh, nootrophics, but a lot of um, products that have come out or have ever been advertised as brain boosting include Herba Mate, uh, which is a uh, plant-based um, uh, source of caffeine, uh, but Herba mate, there's a lot more caffeine uh, with herba mate than, you know, classic um, coffee. And then um, the other one is uh, alpha GPC. I think that's it. Yeah, alpha GPC, um, which actually activates similar ne neurochemical pathways as uh, caffeine typically does. And do you take uh, any of those on a daily or weekly basis? I have Urban Mate every single day. Um, I am addicted to caffeine. I mean, I wouldn't say I need caffeine to function, but I also drink healthy caffeine. You know, I'm not drinking energy drinks. I'm right. drinking uh, Urban Mate tea. Um, I love Focus Aid. Um, I do some work with uh, Aaron and uh, his company, and uh, Focus Aid it, it's it's great. It's a great blend, and and that's I'm not using it as a sales pitch. Like I was using Focus Aid before I actually became involved with um, the branding of Focus Aid. Yeah, I've had some Focus Aid uh, before. I think it's pretty good stuff. I like it. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, their new one. Uh, that's what I'm drinking right now, actually, is Life Aid. Um, yeah, I just finished some of those. Yeah, I just finished the case, actually. I got it right when, yeah. they, right when it came out. Yeah. Yeah, it's so good. The like blend of cayenne pepper with turmeric. Oh my gosh, I love it. Yeah, it's really good. Um, then I think it has some ginger in there, too, which really mm -hmm. makes it awesome. Yeah, um, I've also taken uh, Koyos at one point. I haven't really taken that at all. Um, but if I do get any nootrophic within a day, it's typically um, Herba Mate. Okay, and you said that's primarily through tea? Mm-hmm, okay. yeah. I buy the uh, Herba Mate tea at uh, Trader Joe's. 
Okay, cool. I'm going to check that out for sure. I think that's that's something I I've uh, other than Focus Aid uh, from from Life uh, Life Aid uh, company, um, and I think uh, Alpha Brain from On It. Those are pretty much the only uh, nootropics I've I've ever tried. Um, but I'm interested in some of the like the tea that you just mentioned. Yeah, and- I've had um, the stuff from On It. I was at On It. A month ago, my buddy Connor works for On It now, mm-hmm. and I uh, just stopped in. I was in Austin uh, to see my college roommate. Uh, that's a cool place, man. Oh, it's really cool. Yeah. If you ever get a chance to go, th- yeah. I, well, you've been, so yeah. Yeah, so I'm in, I'm in Dallas, not far from them. I've I've been down there a few times um, for some different things, but yeah, they have a really awesome facility. All right, so I'm gonna completely shift gears on you here. Um, so say there's a nationwide curriculum implemented. Um, okay. and the president calls you up and he says that you're responsible for a chapter of this new book that's going in every school in America. So every, every single kid in America, they're gonna have to read uh, your chapter and they're gonna have to be tested on it and pass before they're even allowed to graduate high school and pursue further education. So given that, what's your chapter of the book? What's your chapter on? What's it about in this book? Ooh, wow. I am loving your questions, man. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Okay, the scientific method, because, you know, we live in this world now of hashtags of alternative facts and people not doing, like, using their common sense and just taking the time to take two minutes and look up the uh, validity of certain information is making sure that kids understand the scientific method that you are taught in third grade fifth grade, and then after that, it's kind of completely erased from the scientific curriculum and is never touched again. Uh, So obviously, the simple version of the scientific method is you have a hypothesis, you then go out in your environment, you don't even have to be in the lab, just go out in your environment, look at the information at hand, collect observations, look at them all together, and then either accept or reject your hypothesis. That's that's the scientific method. That is the entire basis of science. Every time I write a grant, every time I do an experiment, every time I'm executing the experiment, the end goal is to either accept or reject my hypothesis. Um, and you can do that with anything, not just science, human behavior. Uh, so that, that would be my chapter um, and to make sure that students graduate from high school learning, understanding, and applying the scientific method. That's awesome. Yeah, I I read a book a while back called um, I'm gonna forget the author's name, but the book's title is Bad Science, um, and he goes over a lot of like quackery, you know, out in the industry and stuff. How like a lot oh, of yes. a lot of it's not based off of any sort of factual information, but um, good marketing, you know, a lot of good marketing out there. And okay, honestly, I will say, um, you know, I get scrutiny amongst my peers and in, 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 in the field for like some of the uh, endorsements I've done with like say fit aid and stuff uh, because I think scientists are inherently skeptical of everyone else like most scientists are extremely arrogant and like to put themselves up on a pedestal right <laughs> so uh, like I've been accused of being a snake oil salesman by my colleagues and I'm like you have no idea how much behind the scenes like fact checking, I am doing and like science. I like basically compile scientific literature databases for these companies. Like they care and they don't want to be viewed as snake oil salesmen. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, just they say my favorite quote ever is if you, if you ain't got haters, your shit ain't popping. So <laughs> I, 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 I can, I, I can 100% it, agree with that. that yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So let's, um, let's go back to, uh, well, this might be sleep and exercise, but I, I was reading something that you wrote, and um, it could have been on the Fit Aid page, but it said that you had an extreme interest in how we the body can reset itself uh, through sleep and rewire itself through stimulating events. Uh, can you kind of talk about those two? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, sleep serves many functions. Um, there's two stages of sleep. You have the first half of the night you spend in what is called non-rapid eye movement sleep, where essentially that is the only time of the day where your body releases all the anabolic hormones, uh, growth hormone, testosterone, insulin growth factor, 
all those things that are important for muscle recovery, muscle repair, and muscle uh, replenishment. Uh, that, that, of course, is one reason why athletes need to prioritize sleep because if you're truncating non-REM sleep, then the training you just did is a moot point because you're not going to get the growth hormone and the anabolic hormone release to you know, gain a benefit. Um, so that's the one stage of sleep, non-REM sleep. The other stage of sleep is rapid eye movement sleep, which everyone knows about because that's the state of sleep where we dream. Um, and REM sleep is really where we're taking in information, um, that we've learned throughout the day and the brain in and of itself decides which information is important and which is unnecessary. Now, of course, information that it deems important is typically stuff that is repeated over and over again or something that is emotionally salient. The brain will actively take those memories and take those skill sets and learning learning experiences and make sure that they are encoded, reinforced, and then able to be recalled at a later point in time. Um, Because, you know, for centuries, people have always thought of sleep as a state of unconsciousness and a, like, completely passive process. Um, There's, it's no surprise that the the history or origin of the sleep field came from the field of anesthesiology. Uh, But sleep is not like being under anesthesia. Sleep is an active process. Um, It's just the sensory systems and um, systems that are, you know, activated during waking are not active during sleep. And how does um, alcohol play into sleep? Oh, I can talk miles about that. Um, So that's actually what I did my dissertation on is I looked at how alcohol and cocaine stop our biological clocks from working. Um, And and so with alcohol, it could either be to your benefit or it could be to your demise. Um, Alcohol alcohol could be to your benefit if you're traveling across time zones uh, within like say three days apart. So say you're traveling for a business trip to the, uh, from New York to LA And then two days later, you're coming back from L.A. to New York. Uh, If you got drunk on the plane or just stayed, like, mostly drunk (laughs) or, like, buzzed the entire time, your circadian clock, your biological clock, would not shift because that's what alcohol does, is it actively prevents the biological clocks from shifting. Uh, So that's (laughs) that's really the only thing. So if you want to stay buzzed, you can, like, prevent jet lag. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I mean, it, cocaine has the same effect, actually. Um, it works through a different pathway, but it does the same thing. It stops the clock. Um, and so, and, and why would that be a, a bad thing? Um, it's not said, a bad thing. <laughs> no, no. Uh, you said uh, it could work to your uh, benefit or not to your benefit, right? Oh, so not to your benefit would just be like if you weren't traveling, like say you had, you know, had, drank too much before bed. Um, once the alcohol is metabolized from your body, uh, your brain is wired to be in a state of wakefulness. And that's why, like, if you go out drinking and you wake up at, like, 4 a.m., you have a really hard time falling back to sleep. Right. Even if you fell asleep easily, it's because the alcohol has been metabolized. Um, of course, the other thing with alcohol, too, is it actively suppresses the release of uh, anabolic hormones. Um, so that's why, you know, as an athlete, you have to be careful about drinking um, after like a hard day of training because you'll never get the benefits of that training, um, at night if you're consuming alcohol. Oh, that's very interesting. Awesome. And how about, uh, rewiring your brain through simulating events? What was the, what do you mean by that? Oh yes. That's a, that's a really cool area of, uh, neuroscience. So they, in, in neuroscience, we call it environmental enrichment. Um, and honestly, environmental enrichment boils down to novelty like you don't have to be playing those brain games or doing those like mental tasks just doing something that is simply novel and stimulating is enough to constantly rewire your brain and keep it um growing um at the level of neuroscience we call these dendritic arborizations and the reason is because nerve cells look like a tree with a ton of branches. So essentially like a naked tree in the winter. Um, And any type of novel or uh, new stimulus in the environment 
increases the amount of branches on these nerve trees. So then that enhances the amount of communication and the level of communication that each branch can have with each other. And so anything that stimulates you, whether it's uh, doing a math problem, learning a new skill, going to a new place, um, it, it pretty much anything? Yeah, Facebook. I mean, that's, that's why Facebook is so addictive is because everything we see on Facebook is new and novel for the most part, you know? Okay. Or Insta Actually, I feel like Instagram is way more addicting than Facebook. Yeah. Because <laughs> Instagram, like everyone has a different life. Like that's where, where you're really exposed to how different people's lives are. Unless you're following CrossFitters. Like if all your Instagram followers are CrossFitters, then no. Because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the ongoing joke in CrossFit is like you can't do CrossFit. You're not a true CrossFitter if you don't have an Instagram page. Right. right? Yeah, that's 100% true. And yeah, they got to be like there's a, a workout pick, a barbell pick, a you laying down pick. Like there's all the... The, the, oh, yeah. the normal stuff that you got to have. Yeah. Um, I try to avoid that, but, you know, every so often I'm, I'm proud of the workout. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so that's, yeah, anything novel, whatever it is, you know, your brain decides what's novel, you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe try to make those the most productive things for you as possible, but, yeah, that's. Right. All right, so I think, um, you know, I think that, that sums up a lot of the questions I had, and I do want to get to our quick fire questions and then the question sure. of the show. So you ready for those? Yeah, sure. You've already asked like excellent questions. I, you're really, uh, uh, making me work hard here too. I love it. <laughs> I try to come prepared. <laughs> All right. So what's the hardest workout you've ever done? Oh, the squat mafia, Ben Benson specialty. Uh, our gym CrossFit terminus does it every single year, the day after Thanksgiving. It is called the black lung. Okay. Rightfully so. So it's uh, 2159 of thrusters, push ups, front squats, pull ups, burpees, wall walls. Oh, yeah. It's awful. It sounds awful. It's 15 minutes of hell. What are the weight on the, what's the weight on the thrusters? Oh, it's uh, 65. Okay. So it's like doing uh, 65 and 95. So it's essentially doing Fran paired with another two other Fran type workouts. Okay. Yeah. That sounds pretty brutal. Um, the other, I will say my other favorite hard workout, um, is the froning challenge. I don't know if you ever did that. I don't think he came out with it like, uh, three years ago. Is that the or overhead like squat? Years. No, it's six benchmarks. You do six benchmarks in 60 minutes. Oh, okay. So, so every 10 minutes you're starting a new benchmark. Um, it starts out with Elizabeth, and then moves on to Grace, and then uh, Isabel, uh, Diane. Missing another twenty-one fifteen-nine workout. Um, Karen. It finishes with Karen. <laughs> nice. And there's one in between. Wait, did I get them all? One, two. There's one more I'm missing, but uh, if you look it up, it's called the Froning Challenge. I'll definitely look that up. It sounds one of those workouts, two of them maybe. That's enough for a day, but uh... oh yeah, it's uh, <laughs> well. The good thing about Elizabeth though is it's not it's the power clean Elizabeth. Okay, doing, <laughs> doing the squat clean Elizabeth would be. I I just I can't imagine it. Oh, Fran's in there too. Duh, God, I'm so stupid. Um, <laughs> it's, it's Elizabeth Fran. Uh, Isabel, Grace, Diane finishes off with Karen. Wow, that's brutal. And every ten minutes, you're starting that workout every ten minutes. Man, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a try. I mean, once Should. once it's uh, thrown down, I, I gotta try it. But I'm not gonna like it. <laughs> All right. So, in your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Honestly, teamwork. Um, I think being on a team, working on a team, is the best thing to make you a better human. Um, you know, I would say that when I was on a CrossFit team, we got along great. We were a family, but you know, every so often we had conflicts and we'd have to work with each other in our lives and I'd have to adapt to their lives and they'd have to adapt to mine. Um, it's the same way with work now. Uh, what I love about my job is it's all team based. Everything is as a team. Like we work together, we put our egos aside, but you know, sometimes that's hard. And, and, and so I think, Working and being a team is the best thing you can do to enhance and fine tune your mental toughness. Awesome. All right. If you could have only one piece of equipment to train with for the rest of your life, what would it be? 
Oh, a sled. sled. Uh, yeah, the walking sled. Um, so after we quote unquote retired uh, this past spring from uh, CrossFit Games training, I spent 26 days doing. Essentially, I wanted to do a, a marathon of sled drags. Um, I would just put like a, a 45 pound weight or two 45 pound weights on the sled and do a mile every single day. Oh, wow. And it was like the most gratifying, like relaxing thing ever was just walking and pulling the sled. And it was such a great workout. That's awesome. A marathon yeah. of sled pulls. I love it. Yeah. That's an, I guess another fitness challenge for you. Um, I finally just bought a, a walking sled. The gym I'm at now doesn't have one. So I bought within the past week, I bought a, um, uh, weight vest, um, like a tactical weight vest and uh, a walking sled. And it's one of those, um, like from like rogue, like with the, you throw the plates on there, it's got like straps and you put it on yep. your shoulders. Okay. Yeah. And what's great about those two is like Ben, um, the, um, programmer of squat mafia owner of CrossFit terminus. He used to have us, uh, do backwards sled drags. Oh my goodness. Like <laughs> it burns so badly. All right. Awesome. All right, now this is the question of the show. Every every guest gets this one. So what's your best advice you have for becoming a better human being? Uh, this is 100% open-ended. Best advice for, um, hmm. I would say check, I you know, this is kind of like the ongoing um, motto of CrossFit is uh, check your ego at the door. Um, I think years ago, uh, when I decided I hated academia because everyone was arrogant and had an ego, I started putting my ego aside and uh, taking pride in helping other people succeed and their accomplishments. And that benefited me um, for my own personal accomplishments. More people were willing to work with me. More people trusted me um, by means of me doing like selfless service. Uh, so... Yeah, that would, that's my piece of advice is check your ego at the door. Well, I really appreciate that. And um, i like to end by giving you the opportunity to you know point our listeners any direction you'd want them to go, check out your stuff, maybe check out your book or, or anything else that you're doing. Um, where should they go to find out more about your, your work? So you can buy Meathead um, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can buy it directly from the publisher, but I hear it's kind of a pain in the ass, even though that's how I make the most royalties is, <laughs> is you know, to buy it from the publisher. Uh, but it's in hardback, uh, um, paperback, and um, ebook. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram. There's a link to purchasing my book from there. My Instagram handle is docjockzzz. So D O C J O C K Z Z Z. Uh, same with Twitter, although I don't really use it. Uh, but yeah. Awesome. And I will, um, for everyone in the show or listening, I will link to all of those in the show notes. Make sure I have a link to the book and all of the social media accounts so you can check out that stuff. Um, but Allison, thank you so much for your time. This has been a great conversation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you for your service. And thanks for you. Yeah, you're about to really <laughs> ramp yours up here. So I appreciate what yeah. you're doing. Thanks. <laughs>
best. Losers always whine about their best.